My name is Mark Wake. I'm the publisher of Humanoids. Most of you know us. For over 45 years, Humanoids has been publishing graphic novels from the most provocative and transgressive writers and artists across Europe and South America. We act as ambassadors, if you will, for the trailblazers of international graphic fiction, the minds behind such classic science fiction and fantasy as the Eatal, the Meta Barons, and many other of the best-selling graphic novels of all time. We've been very successful in that realm for many years. So we're using that success to not just double down, but triple down. We've set out to further broaden our appeal in America by adding two new imprints to our line. Let me tell you about them. Our Life Drawn imprint finds the fantastic in the real. Reality-based stories, biographies, autobiographies of all walks of life. From celebrities like Rod Serling and Bela Lugosi, to the true story of a Jewish couple who devoted their entire lives to hunting down Nazis worldwide, to the haunting tale of a girl at the crossroads who opens a door to meet her adult self to get advice. Lifetron uses the graphic novel format to explore relevant topics and lives of significance. Some tragic, some funny, but all of them riveting. Similarly, our big imprint for young and middle grade readers gives us the opportunity to introduce kids to age appropriate graphic novels with humor and heart. In our big books, kids can find everything from a ridiculously curious globe trotting bear named Bigby to an invisible grade schooler named Leopold who has to learn that tormenting his big sister is not the best use of his powers. Granted, that along with our trademark best selling science fiction and fantasy sounds like a wide range of material, and it is but it shares one commonality. It's about expanding what sequential art can be. To that end, we're gathering young, diverse creators who really have something to say, who have an important voice, and we're handing them a bullhorn. We wanna introduce you to some of those creators in a moment, but first, let me give you a quick overview of their work. Joe Illich, Hannibal Taboo, and Meredith Laxton are making a comic you can almost hear in NPLS sound. It's the story of an up-and-coming band in the city that cultivated a musical dynasty ranging from Prince to Lizzo. Omni, from Devin Grayson and Aletha Martinez, is a work of fiction that stretches the techniques of the medium. Finally, Nick Nevin and the Bloody Queen by Helen Milan, Don Reardon, and Matthew Dow Smith is a black magic murder mystery that can be solved only by a young girl with a family history of dark sorcery. As a publisher, we have many audiences, but I'll tell you a secret, my hand to God, you're my favorite. I owe you so much, we all do. Librarians continue to be invaluable allies in introducing new readers to the kind of books that can spark dreams and shape lives. We hope the books we're sharing with you today can help you in that very noble mission, and we're proud to be your partners. Okay. Hey, I'm here with Joe Illich, the writer on MPLS Sound. How are you doing this morning, Joe? All right. How's everyone doing today? Well, Mr. Illich, tell us a little bit about MPLS Sound. All right. So, you know, MPLS Sound is really the story of a fictional band called Star Child that in the early 80s basically was this close to becoming a band led by Prince. So the lead of the band, her name is Teresa. She basically grew up really admiring musicians like Jimi Hendrix and her father was a failed musician. So her desire to be a musician and inspired by Prince led her to put together a band in the early 80s and they really competed against the prevalent rock scene of the time, you know, the Minneapolis sound, which was really defined by people like Prince, Mars Day in the Time, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis, those people were competing against the dominant Minneapolis um, kind of like scene at the time, which was um, rock led by white males and really controlled by a label called Two Tone. Mm -hmm. So, this band, Star Child, really has to go up against that tide to make their way to hopefully becoming a band that will be frontlined by Prince. You like writing stories about underdogs, don't you? Yeah, you know, and 
for me, the character journeys are the really most important thing. So, you know, there, there's a lot of historical research that has to go into this, but the idea of a black woman creating a funk band and going up against the tide of a white male led rock scene that's really something that a lot of us can identify with like basically going up against the odds based on a dream based on something that you believe in so that's what really you know for me was important in this story yeah how much of that scene did you know ahead of time and how much did you have to research so the research was intense you know i grew up as a teenager in the 80s i saw purple rain of course i knew prince was god rest his soul i was a fan of his music through the years but the minneapolis sound itself and understanding how prince is kind of like this nexus for all these different people that, that took an intense a lot of research it involved um looking at a lot of interviews reading different books um uh, author named Andrea Swenson wrote a really good book called Got to Be Something Here The Rise of the Minneapolis Sound which was a good reference point for me looking at photographs from the time so I really had to immerse myself in that world to the point where when I would be writing the script I would be listening to prince music yeah. from that period specifically right because yeah. that's the mode that you have to be in um but you know, when I was brought on to this, I was brought on with the very general idea about what Star Child was and the idea of creating this kind of like fictional band that you could actually fit in between the raindrops of history. And right. I really was given a lot of guidance and creative freedom to really dive into that scene, into that music world and bring that to the story. Was there anything you found as you were doing that research that surprised you or really came as a, as a revelation? Yeah, I mean, so one thing is, I honestly did not realize how much um, Minneapolis was important to the future of music. You can trace music now back to what was happening in the 70s and the 80s in Minneapolis, just, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis coming out of that have totally affected soul music, R&B music, as we understand it, because of all of the different acts that they produced. Another thing that I didn't realize was how generous Prince was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His songs. Prince wrote songs and gave them to people. He yep. gave Susanna Hobbs from the bank, you know, from the banks. Um, yeah, Sheena Easton them. gave songs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you're going to see um, elements of that, the truth of Prince's nature, come through in this story because even though he's not a major character, he is, he's a catalyst, right? Yes. Teresa yeah. was on a path. Um, Teresa Booker, the main character, is on a path but her exposure to Prince accelerates that. Yeah. All right. The last thing I want to ask you about, because it it's something I've struggled with as a writer sometimes too, is doing doing sound, doing a book about sound and music in a silent medium. Like what right. what were your challenges there and how did you manage to to get that? Because I think you did a good job of getting that across. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um you know, that was really tough. I think for me, the way it had to be done was, so first off, we took advantage of double page splashes mm -hmm. in the book so that when you open it up, you kind of have this expanse of the whole band. Um, and in that way, it really feels like a music video or something. But another thing that I tried to do was really for the artist, Meredith Laxton, mm -hmm. to give her opportunities to artistically design the pages. So I would say, this is what's happening in a page. You design it however you want, yeah. right? Because, um, you know, it really has to be a symbiotic relationship between the writer and the artist. So giving her those opportunities during certain music scenes to do that, I felt like she really brought it home and people would see that in the book. 
yeah, there's a lot of energy she brings to it. And it's, there is one commonality, whether it's sound or not sound, is you can establish a rhythm. You can establish a rhythm in music. You can establish a rhythm in the page and the way the panels spill out. And I think she's done a great job there. So absolutely. Look, I really like this project. I think it's going to be one of our big books for the year. And uh, thanks for doing this. You're, you're knocking it out of the park, man. Well, thank you so much. No, it's been really a lot of fun and just learning more about the people involved in this and that whole musical movement was really a revelation for me. So I hope that that love and that care and that admiration comes through in the story when people pick it up. Yeah, it's a real snapshot of a moment in time that is still resonant today, which is great. So definitely. All right, go work on the next batch of pages, dude. I'm gonna... Yeah, that's right. I have a little more lettering script to do right. wrap it up. Okay. All right, talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. So, Alifa, you did all the art for volume one of Omni. Can you tell us a little bit about the story? Well, it follows a doctor who is working with the Doctors Without Borders program trying to save people and in war tour in Africa when suddenly her powers ignite. Apparently this has been happening all over the world as she, her powers hit that ignition point right there at the perfect moment and nine different, nine is intelligences come out and they help her problem solve. She realized that there are more people like her out there in the world. So she begins to try to find them and help them. And I guess she's she's going to be the smart one, I figure, who's going to put it all together and make it make sense in the end. So I, I can't wait to see where it goes myself. But just watching her through that first volume, it's like you're trying to get to know her. This is her foundation. You've done a lot of work with like DC and Marvel. So like what we call the big two. What was different about doing this book for you and doing art for characters that people don't? Getting to draw a book like this, you're actually drawing someone that looks like a real person, someone who's doing more real things, you know, not just sitting around waiting for trouble like in a telenovela, you know, going <laughs> out in the world. So it was great to get to do a character that felt real. So I was like, ooh, but, and at the same time, it was very scary because you can do so much more. It's easy to get, to run away from you. So you have to keep grounded in reality. And thank God Devin delivered a wonderful script that helped me do just that. But more so than anything else with Omni, it was the fact that a few years ago, it would be unheard of to have a strong black female character in the lead of a book. In fact, you didn't want to group too many of them together in a book because then it would be considered a black book and black books don't sell. Have you heard those lovely words before? I remember them just like, just like 10, years ago that would be like what you can't have that and now you've got this 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 renaissance this inclusion so it's wonderful to get to see all these different characters from different backgrounds and you know let's 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 talk about the big two for just a second when you have something like black panther that threw open the door that no one even seemed to realize was closed so tightly and then you have all of this, these characters pouring through and to see wonderful strong women in the lead because I must say, I recall being at a show, being on a panel, and you know, they came up, someone asked, this lady stood up and asked, well, where are the black women in the comics? Why don't we see this in comics? And the answer was, well, they're in supportive roles. They're in background roles. And you're like, yes, yeah, so being the long suffering mother of the poor dead person on the ground, that was basically the role they're in. And that's unacceptable. That doesn't reflect our society. So getting to draw a book like this was like, hey, look at that. And she did all this wonderful superhero stuff without throwing one single punch. I'm like, what? And she didn't wear tights either. Oh, where am I? What do you think has caused this final shift of us finally getting at least some and hopefully a lot more strong black women in these lead roles and stories? You know, I really couldn't tell you what's what actually struck that first chord. As I said, I saw how the audience reacted to Black Panther and, you know, seeing it with your regular crew and going, oh, that movie's nice. Thank goodness it's here. Let's, you know, get on to Avengers. But then seeing it with my brother and watching people pour tears, that's when I realized, wait, what exactly are you crying about? You're crying because you're finally seeing people of color in roles that are 
where they are the lead hero and they're not their hero's journey doesn't begin with the with in the hood with the death of some child or some broken family it's actually coming from a place of strength the hero's journey as we've all known it and we've all seen it we've all read it it's just regular and when you do that you open the door for many more regular things to happen and yet we don't have it come far enough i am a hispanic <laughs> woman and i'm waiting for my decent hispanic leads where are they where are oh. these women we're still what, in the kitchen what was it like getting to know cecilia and creating her visual for all of this book where you have this for the smartest woman on the planet is this woman that you're drawing you know what was amazing about her is like after you've drawn a character for a little bit you get used to them and it's like locking in little puzzle pieces i got used to her from the moment i saw her before i actually put her face down I just want, I knew where I was going to go. Like just the hair, the texture, just being able to do all this shadow, this extra work on this, that I really wish they'd given me more time to work on it. Like the final book, I did not rush. I sat there with those last nine pages that actually showed the intelligence at work in those montage panels, those big pages. And I'm like, I'm gonna sit here and I'm just going to do this thing the way I want it, the way I think I sh it should look, you know, just, being able to draw so many facets of her, so many different ways, so many angles, so many, just playing with her. It's like, I, she was one of my favorite characters to do. Did you, have you spent, ever spent like a lot of time in libraries or were there any books as a kid that really inspired you to be an artist? Oh my goodness. Yeah, but I'm gonna tell my Beowulf story now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so when I first came into the country, my English, I'd, I was shy to speak English because I landed in Florida. And that was like, you know, you might as well, those people don't speak English in Florida. They speak twang. It's something else. It's like, <laughs> so I retreated into myself and I had teachers who also spoke Dutch. So for two years, they kind of just, you're in a, you're in a wall until finally I got to seventh grade. And there was this teacher who broke out this book and told this wonderful story. And she said it and she's speaking this like, oh, Gaelic language. It was so beautiful to hear. And it was a Beowulf story. And I'm like, that literally just turned my brain on immediately. I was like, it, it just, it put this, this heat in me to like, I know what I want to do. Cause I've always drawn and I knew I wanted to draw, but I didn't, understand what I wanted to draw right up until that moment. So I was like, this is it. I've got to do heroes. Now I didn't know that girls didn't draw this stuff, but I did something <laughs> about that. And I didn't let that stop me. But just getting a hold of that be able that that first language it took for us not to know who wrote it. It's just enduring. It's just part of us. It's a fabric of us being human, being together. It's a big story. It's just epic and it lasts. That was the book that literally just set me on my way for as far as this is, is concerned, as far as art is concerned, it made me want to draw heroes. I knew what I was supposed to do at that point. So to have libraries to now take interest in this medium, it also helped reinforce English for me. I spoke English, I was shy to it, but to see it, it's in front of me. And these words are the same, no matter how people are saying them, it's like, Oh my goodness, it's amazing. I hope comics become, remember their roots, that a lot of people reinforced the English or learned English by reading comics. I'm not the only one. So to me, we're wandering away from that a little bit. And we need, we need help here in our industry. We need help from you librarians. Bring us back around. Remind us that this is what we're here for. I'm here with author Helen Milan, and she is the writer of Nick Niven and the Bloody Queen, which is out now with humanoids. So Helen, can you give us just like a quick synopsis of your story? Nick Niven and the Bloody Queen is um, the story of a young girl who uh, gets brought to the countryside with her mom and brother against her will. And she's very bored and very sullen until she meets this mysterious older man who she falls for and um, basically starts stalking um, and through her connection with him uh, a kind of world of myth and magic is unleashed as she discovers that she is the ancestor of an ancient goddess. 
of Northumberland, where she is, and uh, nature and magic kind of coalesce around her. Where did you get like the inspiration and where did you get the idea and what drew you to this whole theme of more like the Celtic mythology and the folklore? Yeah. You know what, I'm actually really excited that we're um, recording this for to go out to, uh, to libraries or librarians because um, one of the kind of deepest seated inspirations for this book comes from uh, novels that I read as a child of like Alan Garner and M.R. James and uh, and things like that. And these are all books that I kind of experienced through spending like inordinate amounts of time in the library as a child. Um, and those experiences really kind of gave me quite a, a lifelong love of folk lore and folk horror and that kind of, uh, that kind of space in between kind of magic and the mundane. How many women love horror? So, and specifically folk horror, like when it comes to anything that you read, anything that you watch, the majority of the content absorbers are women. Why do you think that is? I think that's such an interesting conversation because, um, I mean, uh, it's especially true for folk horror, but it's true for all sorts of horror that, uh, that it is, the audience is dominated by women. And it's one of the only kind of subgenres or kind of genre types where that's true. Um, and uh, or like has been historically true for quite a long time um, and I wonder if it's something to do with how women experience the world that means that horror can be quite resonant um, because the world is or can be uh, a, a slightly more threatening place in certain ways for women than, than for men uh, women experience a world that holds threats that don't necessarily exist for men in quite the same way um, and so there's something kind of powerful about like exercising that through through media and I wonder also like I know that for me personally I really um, respond to in especially in the pagan traditions and in the pre-christian traditions there's a lot of incredible powerful female like goddesses and all these kind of creatures and a lot of the kind of folk iconography and the kind of archetypes I think deal with um, fear of like fear of the power of sexuality for example um, and, and women's power and some of the kind of early goddesses and stuff that uh, that kind of over the years got co-opted and changed and turned kind of demonic or into witches or whatever that <laughs> whole process is very much about uh about a fear of the of the power of women um so i mean i think there's there's also something like actually in the kind of iconography that's appealing um but also yeah i'm just really really attracted to powerful women but who are also, maybe they're flawed, maybe they're evil, <laughs> you know, maybe we don't <laughs> understand them in a, you know, on our, on our kind of plane, or maybe they're kind of inhuman in some way. I'm really, really attracted to, to that, like. But in a lot of folk where, um, like the women are not, they don't think they're as powerful as they are. And you have that with Nick Niven where she doesn't know her own power. Which is why it's yeah, such also an enticing book, is seeing her kind of learn that about herself. Yeah, and that's really something that I kind of wanted to express because I think that that's almost close to a universal of the female experience of being a young teen going through puberty into the kind of early part of womanhood. And you find that you have this sort of power that you you didn't have before as you become like a, a, a kind of sexual being and all this sort of this sort of thing and I think that uh, that yeah you find out that you have this thing that you didn't know about before and how you um, how you deal with that or harness it how it affects how the world reacts to you like that's part of the reason why I'm so interested in that period of um, of a, a girl's life, a woman's life. That's why so much, I, like I consume a lot of media that's all 
about girls of around that age coming into you know who they are and like from the kind of I don't know like lowbrow teen dramas to things like fish tank things that like explore that type you know that kind of unknown power that society um finds very scary in you um but also which society kind of um which a, a woman having makes society scared of also well I um, mean I, I feel like being a teenage girl is almost like being in your own personal horror story because it, it's scary it's scary it's intimidating a lot of things are happening that you don't fully understand but I think you're definitely right when it comes to that point in a woman's life that's when you first start becoming powerful yeah um and that's what I feel like it's the first time that society starts getting scared of you yeah, well, exactly, exactly, because society is kind of, uh, well, especially historically, hopefully we're getting better and better, but society is, and so it's very ingrained culturally, society is frightened of of uh, women when they, once they kind of get to that sort of blossoming of, of womanhood, you know, then, yeah. uh, then the, everything shifts, everything changes. So, yeah, and I, I mean, Nissy is kind of obviously going through that in a very, the main character in the book, she's going through that in a very kind of extreme way. But she has various different um, examples of, of womanhood in front of her because she has, she has her kind of mother who is, you know, um, her mother who's, who's uh, a woman in a certain type of way. She's the mother. She's the carer, and, and then you also have this this goddess who's incredibly powerful, but completely cold. You know, with no mm. kind of regard for for effects that she has in the world. And then you've got Nissy, who's maybe somewhere in between. She's finding out where she's going to be and what way she's going to go. And it's a great journey. I, again, I'll say it, I say it again, I say it every time. I love, I love Nick Niven and the Bloody Queen. I think it's definitely um, very different. It was a very different book for us at Humanoids. It brought in such a different demographic for us when it comes to readership. And I think it's amazing. Um, so for everyone who's watching, go, go pick up a copy of Nick Niven and the Bloody Queen. Um, librarians, please email me. Helen, thank you so, so much as always. It's always a delight talking to you. And that's only a sampling of the books that we are offering you in the months to come. Harley, you wanna take us out? Thanks, Mark. Thank you guys again so much for watching our video and listening to our amazing creators talk about their amazing projects. Again, we are so appreciative of the librarians. We truly believe that you guys are the tastemakers in your community. If you have any questions at all regarding anything humanoids related, please feel free to shoot me an email. My email is on the screen. And thank you again so much.